This episode is brought to you by Andreas Hamm. Uh, my name is Winifred Phillips. I'm a game composer. I've been composing music for games for over 11 years now, and I've gotten a chance to work on some fun projects, including Assassin's Creed Liberation HD, five games so far in the Little Big Planet franchise, Speed Racer, Spore Hero, The Maw, The Da Vinci Code, uh, lots more. I've had a great time. I started out um, as a composer for a series of radio dramas called Radio Tales for National Public Radio. And as a part of that, I was creating musical scores for classic stories of science fiction and fantasy and horror, you know, like Dracula and the War of the Worlds and Beowulf, things like that, which was terrific because it was very inspiring work. But also because it's radio, there's no visual component. And when there isn't a visual component, the music can uh, get into the listener's head a bit more and suggest what the visual component should be, uh, create a sense of the kinetics and tell the story a bit more, um, pace it in a way that creates mental images. And I, you know, I found that when I transitioned into video games, the idea of music creating these mental images and having that sort of intimate um, relationship with the player was helpful. Uh, thinking about it that way uh, helped me to uh, compose music in a way that is different from the way you would think of it when it's composed to visual content like television and film, where it's very much synced to a, a, a very set linear narrative and a, a lot of visual cues that set the pace of the action. With, um, with video games, it's not quite that way. Uh, the music needs to tell the story in, in its own language on its own in a sort of parallel prose to what the, um, the story of the game is doing. So I found myself leaning on some of the, the lessons I learned from my radio work. I think that sometimes when new composers are getting into the video game field, it's so overwhelming, the technical demands, and it's very uh, different from the way in which we think of music composition. It's music composition, when you learn it through the university system, it has its own grammar and a sense of linearity. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it, t it tells a story in a conventional way. But with um, video games, it's just not that way. You have to sort of turn your thought process upside down and think of video game music more as a, a set of components that come together in a fluid way and uh, are very gymnastic and agile to tell many various different parallel stories depending upon what the gamer is doing. So uh, that is something that I really wanted to help readers understand, uh, to get them over that initial really tough hump of wrapping your head around thinking of music in a completely different way and um, trying to work your own creative process into a, a whole new art form, really. Um, the university system is starting to embrace the idea of, of incorporating game music studies into a composition curriculum, but there is no major in this yet. It, there's no comprehensive course of study. So your composition majors are still coming up through the system thinking of music composition in more traditional ways, and that can be disconcerting when you're when you have to kind of set a lot of that aside and I wanted to help in, in that process which is just very difficult I wanted to smooth that out a little bit make it easier you know there are a lot of wonderful techniques that have been developed over the decades and they're still being experimented with so it's very exciting there's always a sense of a new frontier in video game composition uh, uh, some of the techniques I've worked with um, horizontal resequencing in which music is composed in as a collection of short chunks or segments that can be arranged and rearranged um, according to the course of play, according to what's happening, and yet still connect fluidly and make sense as a musical story. Uh, thinking about music in that way, you have to sort of envision the musical pieces sort of like a game of puzzle pieces that fit together in various combinations. So it's kind of uh, inspiring and intellectually stimulating to compose that way. And then there's vertical layering, which is a, a way to compose music by thinking of it as a set of 
um, vertical components that are stacked on top of each other, kind of like in a vertical tower, um, so that you can add and subtract musical elements according to what's going on. It's a, a matrix of musical elements that can grow and then simplify depending upon what's happening. So the music can kind of swell and become more expressive or it can change and become something completely different. And yet you still feel like you're listening to the same piece of music, the same musical idea. And that's very interesting and challenging work, especially when it gets very complex. Like for the Little Big Planet franchise, they have a very complex vertical layering system. So that has been one of the greatest learning experiences for me in terms of taking that system to its max and seeing how it can be very, very clever and very, very complex and challenging as an artist. It, it forces you to kind of re-examine the way in which you put together instruments and their relationships and the way in which they can communicate and, uh, and counterpoint against each other. That's fun work. It's just interesting work. And then apart from that, there's the uh, MIDI uh, format in, in which all of the components of the music can be taken apart because it's just, it's data. So it, uh, it stays as a set of instructions uh, and a sound library that emits their sounds according to the instructions. So um, what's great about that is then the, um, the game's programming can manipulate that instruction set and it can make the music extremely reactive and um, very, very flexible, even more flexible than other systems, because every single component of the music system can be literally taken apart and dissected. So that's really interesting work and has such a long history because it's the way in which game music was done right from the start. And um, now it's kind of making a comeback because the uh, the 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 game engines, the uh, the consoles, the the PCs, they have the horsepower now to be able to support more rich sound libraries that can be uh, triggered by MIDI data. So uh, the the idea that MIDI cannot be expressive is being re-examined because the instruments can now be more expressive than they ever were before. So that's interesting to see how MIDI is being re-examined and how it's starting to filter back into our process. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that. I actually find the soundtrack process to be really stimulating. One of the things about composing for video games that can be both very exciting and also sometimes a little disheartening is that when you're creating the music, you have ideas for the, um, the perfect musical moments. And they happen during the course of the game, but they're so unpredictable. In terms of trying to expose a listener to those moments, when they play the game, they'll experience them, they'll encounter them, but it will be sporadic and unpredictable. And if you wanted to just take a listener by the hand and say, these are the places I want you to hear, it's much more difficult. That's why I find putting together a soundtrack to be really exciting, because then I can look at all of these interactive components and think about where those special moments were in the game. And then I can sort of shape it and present it like the story that is presented in the game, but in a more concise and compacted version, uh, kind of like an abridgment of a, of a sprawling story so that people can experience that um, musical uh, delivery um, in, in a way that allows me to, to point out and show the things that I'm excited about. Um, so. I, while it is different from the way in which we experience music in the game, it's also um, it, concise and crystallized. And it's a way that I can further communicate with the listeners and try to express to them what excited me about working on that game. This has been some of the most interesting uh, research that I did for this book. Uh, the idea that music communicates to the listener in subconscious ways that we don't really understand on a conscious level. And yet, if we look at it and we study it, we can see that music is fundamental in the understanding of things like plot in a, in a film experience, certainly in a game experience. The, um, the idea of musical communication can, can profoundly impact our understanding of events. And that was very interesting to me. Um, I also looked at some research about how musical genres 
are preferred by certain types of players. I looked at the DGD1 model, uh, uh, demographic gamer um, data, uh, that talked about the personality characteristics of certain types of gamers and the kind of music that they enjoy listening to. And it was interesting how that, um, that personality data from the DGD1 model uh, corresponded with another study that showed certain personality characteristics also preferred certain types of music. And that music tends to filter into those types of games. That, that connection I thought was just so interesting. Um, we, we see game uh, genres preferring certain types of music, but we don't really understand why that is. It, it's just, it seems like it's a tradition of techno music in a racing game, um, a kind of edgy rock in a horror game, things like that. We, we hear that, but we don't, and we know there's a tradition of it, but we don't know why. And I thought it was interesting to kind of get a little glimpse into why this music speaks to gamers who love these games. That was just, that was just so inspiring to me. I, I'm always trying to understand why gamers um, get excited about the things they get excited about because I'm trying to feed into that excitement and intensify that experience. The more I can understand what excites a gamer, the better job I'm going to do. So uh, the whole privilege of doing this research and trying to share these ideas with readers was just really illuminating for me. I think I grew as a composer while I was also trying to help other people understand what excites gamers. So that was just tremendous fun. Expectations are something that I think we're all dealing with. Certainly, uh, game developers are very aware of the expectation of the audience that appreciates the type of the game that they're making. And um, so as composers, we want to fit into this um, this structure of game development. So we want to make sure that our music is serving the purpose as much as the game itself is serving the purpose. So we're thinking about um, what gamers are expecting or what they would get excited about as much as the game developers are thinking about that. And in a way, you can think about that and think, well, that may be limiting. But on the other hand, I think when we look at any genre of music and we think about it in terms of being a composer, we, as composers, we love music. We love all kinds. We are sort of genre agnostic, I think. We, uh, we look at it all with curiosity. It's all interesting to us. But there's going to be some little kernel, some specific aspect of any musical genre that I think tickles a person's creative instinct. Uh, and it's different for every composer, I think. Looking at, say, uh, the techno genre for a racing game, just looking at it and listening to it with a sort of objective and open-minded perspective, there'll be some aspect that will be intriguing or that will be maybe even amusing or it will tickle your fancy or make you think of ideas. And it, then you pursue that. And that's the way I think you stay true to yourself because pursuing the thing that inspires you is always the best way to express yourself as an artist. When I think about, oh, is genre limiting? Is it going to mean that I'm not going to be able to be my best as a composer? I try to remember that there, every kind of music has something to teach me. Um, and if I'm open-minded about it, I, I'm going to be able to grow much more than if I just said, well, this kind of music isn't for me. I think every kind of music should be for me, just as it should be for everybody. There, um, we, it is, if we embrace it, we have the opportunity to be surprised by it. If I can compare it to the idea of, of the way in which people speak, everybody, uh, we're all speaking in the same language. We're, we're speaking in English right now. It has its own vocabulary, um, but we choose uh, the way in which we put together the grammar in our own way. And it would be hard for me to say, I have a speaking style and this is how I speak. Uh, to, to be able to say that. And yet people could recognize it looking, maybe looking at the way in which I write my book. And uh, they could recognize the way in which I put together ideas. I, I think that's also true in music. Uh, I, I couldn't say, well, there are particular instruments that I like to use above all else, um, or there is a particular genre that I tend to favor. And when people hear that, they know it's me. But I think the, the grammar, 
that I use as a composer, the, um, the way in which I put ideas together, and, and maybe just a little of a, a sense of humor or a, a certain emotional undertone, is, it's distinct to me. I think people can recognize it. I remember when I did Assassin's Creed Liberation HD, uh, there was an interview uh, in a podcast with a couple of the voice actors from, um, that, uh, from that game. And it, I, something that one of the actors said really touched me. He said that he found the music of Liberation, it, it felt like it was warm and it was, it was um, almost uh, mothering and it, uh, it had a, it, which is a strange thing to say about music for Assassin's Creed Liberation. Uh, but then again, the main character is such a, a vibrant woman and she's so full of, of humor and she's experienced loss and she's grieving still, but she has such a sense of what's right and just. And to, to hear that quality of her personality came through in the music, uh, that that just meant a lot to me. I, and if I could say that kind of element is what is distinctive about me as a composer, I, I would be very happy to say that. <laughs> I, um, I think that it's part of it is that you get, you get inspired by the story. Um, really being in close contact with the developers and understanding what's getting the team excited excites me and gets me on board. I, what I really want to do is express their vision as much as possible. And um, so if I'm feeling uh, from the, 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 the power of the game, there's an edge, there's a punch to it. It's hard, it's aggressive, it's edgy, it's got momentum, it's got drive. Then it's my job to make that happen. And um, so I, I enjoy kind of digging down and finding those places, and kind, kind of like method acting, you sort of get dig deep. And <laughs> so I, I, I enjoy that process of kind of digging down and finding the emotional center of whatever it is I'm supposed to do and uh, telling it in the language that I use as a composer. The idea of leitmotif has a super duper long history. It is associated strongly with Berlioz, with the Symphonie Fantastique. The idea that a melody can be associated with a concrete idea uh, that has a very strong narrative aspect. Uh, the lost love was the um, idea that was expressed in Berlioz's symphony, and he had a melody that represented it and came back in various forms throughout the course of the work. Uh, it was powerful in that way because it was something that our consciousness could fix on. It was like a true north. It gave structure to everything, and it led us forward throughout the throughout the experience we were having. Now, I think that um, Ide Fix, uh, which is the, um, the idea of the, the fixed idea, um, which came from Berlioz's work, is the centralized um, concept that leads us through the, the most important musical idea representing the most important narrative idea in any work of entertainment, um, a television program, a film, a video game. And it can be the heart of a musical score. Now, when you talk about the idea that, um, that themes can seem repetitive, it's true. But that presupposes that the theme that is being expressed is always being expressed in the same way. And I think that that is just tremendously limiting. A theme is an incredibly elastic, gymnastic thing. It can be turned upside down, turned on its head, um, separated out into lots of motifs, used as figures, little fragments. It can be rearranged. It can be inverted. It can be used. It can be transmuted into a chord structure. It can be so subtly used as to be almost subliminal. And I think as composers, we can use these themes in subliminal ways. In, the, in that kind of intimate relationship with the player that says, you may notice, but you don't know why. That's when themes are, I think, at their best. We shouldn't be always saying, ah, there's the theme. Because if we're doing that, it's overt, it's obvious, it lacks art, it, it, it lacks finesse. Uh, a theme can come back in a way that feels like, um, 
like a part of your environment, like a, a, a pattern in the, the wallpaper, like something that feels like it belongs in the world you're in and yet doesn't, doesn't point an arrow to itself to say, you know me. And I think that is one of the best ways to create musical identity in any work like a, a film, a television program, a video game, when a, there is a musical element that says, you know me, that creates identity and familiarity, and yet isn't always screaming at you to say, here's the melody you know. When it's like that, then it is, it, it can be profound. It, when you hear that, then you can set, you can feel that kind of sense of, of quieting in you that says, I know what, where I am, and this is something important. But you don't have to say, oh, and it's because I'm hearing this melody. Um, so I think the more subtly we look at it and the more artistically we approach it, the more powerful it can become. I, I think that it's just such a wonderfully enjoyable intellectual exercise to think about all of the ways in which themes can serve us as composers and give us tools. It's not just one tool. It's like the Swiss army knife of tools. It turns into a million things that we can use in a million different ways if we just look at it that way. So I'm always being surprised by the way in which themes serve me as a composer, the way they help me. They're, they're, there's these little assistants that stand by me and, and give me all sorts of help all along the way. Yeah, certainly the development team has its asset lists that it sends to you and they definitely want you to fulfill the requirements that you're, you're creating a, a, a body of work that's going to support the mechanism of the game. So certainly you want to be very sensitive to what exactly it is they're asking for. And if they are saying to you, we don't want this music to feel particularly thematic, we don't want it to come across that way, you have to take that very seriously. But at the same time, one of the things I find interesting about being a composer is that nobody, nobody else on the team is going to have my specific set of skills. They're not going to understand music exactly the way I do. So I can communicate in ways, very subtle ways, that can infuse meaning into the music that I'm creating, even if it isn't overtly uh, communicating it that way. So if I'm working with a team that says, we don't really want it to be particularly melodic, okay, it can be not particularly melodic. But perhaps there is a subtle chord structure that is giving us a rising feeling that makes us feel like we're heading towards a certain culmination that feels vaguely thematic, but not. You know. They, Sometimes you can use something meaningfully musical that is sort of in a macro sphere. It's a large scale um, expression. It takes time to come across. And yet, if you can step away from it, like stepping away from a pointillist painting so that you can see the entire painting rather than all the little dots, then you can see the meaning in it when you see it from the large perspective rather than looking at it close up and just seeing, at, seeing it as a selection of patterns. That interests me too. I, I enjoy a minimalism quite a bit because it, on one hand, it, it feels like it's just a very pattern-based music that doesn't feel particularly melodic. It doesn't have a very romantic feeling. And yet it, is, it can be so powerful in communicating emotion, in changing a person's mental state. There's an almost altered state of, of, of consciousness quality to it that's very interesting to me. Uh, so I, I, don't all, I don't think that if I'm being told, stay away from melody, uh, don't use themes, I don't think, oh, well, my hands are being tied. There's always another way to infuse my personality and a sense of musical meaning into what I'm doing. I'm just being challenged to, th to think of it from a different angle and to be more creative about it. Well, I've worked with middleware occasionally, um, but I find that um, I, I've had a lot of great experiences with a lot of audio directors on various teams. And um, it, strangely enough, um, with the people I've worked with, the implementation itself is such a richly creative process. Um, I don't want to entirely step on those guys' toes. Uh, they have a vision. Sometimes it's a really grand vision. And I don't want to say, look, 
this isn't in your ballpark, this is in mine, and I'm going to do this. So it depends. With a project like The Maw, I was working very closely with the developers at Twisted Pixel, and uh, we developed the whole um, musical system hand in hand. I put together the musical implementation plan for that, and I was um, I was working with them on where the triggering points would be, and it was very collaborative. But there are other teams and other projects in which their vision is guiding me in terms of the way in which they like the musical matrix to come together, all those different elements, and I absolutely don't want to step on their toes on that. I get inspired by their ideas. Spore Hero was a tremendously inspiring project for me. It was a very complex system, lots of moving parts, and I really wouldn't have wanted to meddle in the way in which that was put together um, because I, I don't know if, as from my perspective, I would have been able to come up with some of the fantastic ideas that the audio team came up with for the implementation plan. So I think on a project per project basis, you have to kind of make those decisions as you go and with the personalities you're working with. I've done a lot of um, these uh, movie tie-in games, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Da Vinci Code, Shrek the Third, Speed Racer, things like that. And um, people um, will ask me, did I work with the composer of the film? Uh, was I inspired by their music? And the thing of it is, the way the development process works, the game music is usually completed long before the composer for the film um, writes a single note. So I'm working more from the intellectual property and the guidance of the game development team. And when I'm working with the team, it's very similar to any project. Um, their ideas for what the music should be uh, guide me, and we have conversations about style. And then I do music research to see what excites me, and then I get into it. But the thing that's great about franchise games like this, games that are tied into existing intellectual properties, is that there is a pre-existing rich world that I get to explore, I get to read, I get to learn, um, I get to go all over and get inspiration and insights into the creative process of the people who initially conceived these projects. Uh, I try to do that with every project I work on, whether it's based on an intellectual property that pre-exists or not. But with those games, the ones that aren't tie-in games, um, I need to really try to get very, very close to the team and look at all of the development documents and uh, talk to them extensively and, and, and try to get into their heads to see what was their inspiration, what was the brass ring that they're reaching for for their game, and that's what then I'm responsible to try to reflect musically. Uh, but with, with a game like, uh, say, The Da Vinci Code, I get to read the Dan Brown novel. And I get to, um, to read all sorts of reflections on uh, what the inspirations were there. And then I get to read some historical accounts of the life of da Vinci. And I get to listen to music from that period and lots of wonderful liturgical music. And there's this huge uh, body of material that I get to be inspired by for that. So um, I find those kinds of projects to be extra specially uh, propulsive. As, uh, as a composer, I, 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 I'm asked a lot if I feel like my hands are tied. I, I, no, I feel like I'm kind of set free. I, I, I feel like I've got wings on those. They, there's so much to work with, and it's, it's a lot of fun. The first project that I did that was in sort of a similar interactive music system was The Maw. And it's, it's called a vertical layering system. It has the layers that um, the, the audio recordings that are running parallel and uh, the musical elements that kind of stack on top of each other. I'd done that for them all first. And so when I met with the folks um, at Sony Computer Entertainment Europe to talk about Little Big Planet, I had already worked on a similar system, although not as complex. Their system is six layers. And so you just take the system I worked with on the mall and just double it. Uh, so that was really a challenge, but really interesting. I kind of had to put aside any ideas that I had about how you construct a piece of music, because normally we just think, okay, we're going to arrange all of these instruments, all of these melodic lines, all of these chord progressions to support each other into one vision. And that's how we're going to create a piece of music. But for a, a something like Little Big Planet especially, you're thinking more about simultaneous ensembles. 
uh, it's not one piece of music. It's essentially several pieces of music that just so happen to be able to play, be played at the exact same time and work together, but also work alone. Uh, so it's, uh, it's the idea of, you can almost picture a, a, a soundstage of musicians and there are all of these little, on, little uh, quartets and ensembles that kind of clustered together, and, but they're all playing together, but they're also perfectly capable of playing alone and very entertaining by themselves as well. There was a learning curve in embracing that, but once I kind of had that sink into my system, it became really inspiring. Uh, just th the idea that a piece of music doesn't have to be a single piece of music, that one piece of music can essentially tell many stories at once. And depending upon how the layers are activated and deactivated, how their levels are adjusted, it can always be turning into something else and you know, communicating in a different way. So, so that was really pivotal for me. Um, I, th I don't think before then I had ever experienced interactive music to that degree of complexity. Uh, but once I really got comfortable with that, I, I felt really liberated to think about interactive music as being something that was totally accessible to me and was just a, a new language for me to play with. And uh, so that was just something that I was very grateful to have been a part of. You know, it's funny, I get very old school at the beginning. I, I just take out a piece of blank paper and um, I write down layer one, layer two, layer three, down the sides. So I have the six layers there and, and the lines after them. And then I start trying to imagine what instruments would be complementary together and how they would fit within each other. Uh, when you think of this kind of music composition, I tend to think of it kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. The, uh, in terms of the sonic spectrum, each layer needs to occupy its own little territory uh, so that they don't step on each other. Because essentially, if they're all just sort of spread out sonically, if they're encompassing a wide equalization range, then they could just turn into a great big mass of mud. And you, you don't want that. You, you want it to feel as though each has a distinct territory that it lives in. And when you remove it, you, there's a gap that you have just created. So when the layers are activated and deactivated, you can really feel it. And it's exciting when a layer comes in and then when it goes out. It's not just a, a sense of summing, of, of sound piling on sound. When something comes in, there was a space for it. And you didn't realize until it, it entered that that area was empty, but now you know it was. And oh, how interesting these relationships are now. That, um, so starting with just that piece of paper and thinking about, okay, I'm doing a piece of music, it's going to be in a particular style because this level is going to have this particular feel to it and we want to support it with this kind of emotion. So what kind of instruments would work with that? And what are their tone colors? How do they relate? And um, then which ones would work well together? The idea behind the layer system is that if you play a single layer, it's going to be satisfying to listen to like its own little composition, especially with Little Big Planet because it is user created content. So the players get the opportunity to um, implement these layers into their own levels. And what you really want to do is make it as much fun for the player as possible. So you want them to feel when they activate a layer that it's dramatic, something happened and it was exciting. Um, so each layer needs to have a very vivid, distinct identity so that when it enters, you know it right away. And that makes it more fun for the player. So that makes it very important to think about these little ensembles as occupying their own space and how they fit together is very important. I spend a lot of time just sitting and staring at that sheet of paper and saying, well, could this instrument go with this one? And would they feel nice alone, like this cute little ensemble? But then they would still fit into this little space if I put this and this on top of them, and that kind of thing. And um, that's sort of interesting, like a puzzle. So it's, it's fun in that way. Uh, just to sort of imagine what's going to work. Um, and then at the end of it, when you finally, you know, done all of your erasing and you've, you've 
put it down in a way that you say, this is going to be it. Then you just stare at it and you say, OK, if this doesn't work, I'm, I'm really up a creek. Uh, so, uh, but this is it. This is what it's going to be. And then I set it aside. It's clipped to its little clipboard looking at me. And I start putting together these um, ensembles. At that point, it's, it's mostly faith that it's, that it's going to work, that the plan was right. Um, and so far, it hasn't really let me down. There, sometimes, as I go along, I may say, OK, I'm going to take this instrument and switch it into another layer. Um, and I'll do that occasionally, but not a lot, because if you're doing that a lot, then basically the whole house of cards is going to fall down. But um, if you're doing it a little bit, it, that's all right. It, it just those little tweaks to make everything feel happy, but all of the layers are happy together like a little family. Uh, but that, but that's my, kind of my process to sort of sort through it so that I don't go crazy and um, it, just to make it user friendly for me as the composer so that I can um, I, I can do it in a way where it feels well planned. Well, apart from you know the the most important things, which are a love of music composition and a lot of experience having. Uh, composed, listening to a lot of music in a, in a way that's very open-minded. All that stuff's important. But I think that it's just, once you get to the point where you're starting to think about being in video games, the idea of just really being open to the to setting aside everything you've learned. It's, it's kind of like, I suppose, boot camp when you join, you know, you're in the army. Not that I know that much about this, but I imagine the idea of um, you build yourself up with an aspiration to, to do something that is very challenging. But when you get into the situation, you sort of have to get torn down again and reshaped in a, in a new way. And I think that happens to people who are composers and then move into video games. You, you come into it with a skill set that's suited towards composition, but then you sort of have to tear yourself down and rebuild yourself, shaping it around the needs of games and the way in which they're put together. And while that sounds kind of distressing, um, it's, not in, it's not that bad a thing to have happen to you. Uh, you learn a lot about yourself, and you become uh, more flexible. And um, you discover skills and creative parts of yourself that you wouldn't have thought that you had. And there, I think with every composer that gets into video games and learns that they love it, there's some part of it that really speaks. Uh, the, some part of the technology is exciting. Some part of the creative aspect is, is really exciting. And that is what leads you through that process of sort of rebuilding yourself and retraining your mind to think about music in a different way. So, um, so I think that's sort of the journey you take. Well, uh, apart from um, just saying that I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to have this career and to be able to share this in the, in the book that I've written, um, it's, it, it's, that's something that I, I really kind of want to stress. And uh, the, the, the chance to have um, shared this. I've been able to sort of make a career for myself that lasted long enough so that I was able to learn something that I could pass on. And just getting there was, um, it was, kind of, was a, a big challenge. But just being there to be able to, to share it has been so fulfilling for me to be able to um, to reach out to other younger composers and to learn from them. And um, there's so much that's changing about video game development every day. And it's, uh, it's a very fluid and dynamic art. So um, being able to be drawn in further into the game audio community and to uh, talk to people who are just coming up and learning it and what their concerns and their fears are it, it, it just it feeds me as a composer and it, it gives me ideas and it makes me feel privileged that I'm a part of it so